Am I you're on. I mean, I can introduce you, and I assume everybody knows you who's here. So I'm I'm really happy to have uh, Thomas here from Electrum. It's one of my favorite open source Bitcoin project, one of the oldest Bitcoin projects, I think. So thanks a lot for coming, and then uh, looking forward to hear your talk. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. It's a pleasure for me to come back to Zurich. I lived here 10 year, uh, 16 years ago, <laughs> so uh, I had yesterday the opportunity to see the city again. It was nice. It hasn't changed much, but okay. <laughs> so um, I started to work on Electrum in uh, 2011. Actually, uh, yeah, I learned about Bitcoin in uh, December 2010. And then uh, I started playing with it and writing scripts. And, um, and well, at the beginning it was a hobby, and then I, I started to do only that. So I, I left my job temporarily. I used to be a researcher in uh, computer science, and now I'm uh, working on Electrum full time. Um, I'm not a cryptographer, actually. My, my field is... Uh, is machine learning and artificial uh, neural networks. So it doesn't have a lot to do with Bitcoin, except maybe for the decentralized aspect that has always attracted me because the neural nets are also a decentralized uh, model of computing. So I guess this is the common point. Okay, um, so when I started this project, uh, there was a little bit of opposition from uh, people involved with uh, the core Bitcoin client. It wasn't called like that at the time. Uh, because uh, there is this idea that uh, it's better to roll a full node and that people should not use uh, light clients. Um, and then in 2011, there was also the mybitcoin.com fiasco, which is a little bit like a, a rehearsal of empty gox. <laughs> so it was a web wallet that was used massively and uh, that got uh, hacked, or maybe hacked by its anonymous operator, and a lot of bitcoins were stolen. And after that, confidence was broken for a while. The price of bitcoin was uh, slashed by, I don't know, maybe five or ten. Um, and so I decided to, to start writing a client that would be safer. Uh, because I thought, okay, uh, the economy, the bitcoin economy, uh, needs lightweight clients. We need uh, bitcoin to be easy to use. Not everybody can run a full node. At this time, also, the full node was not deterministic. Uh, I think it only started recently, but Electrum was one of the first deterministic wallets, and it was the first one that had this feature that uh, you can actually have a seed phrase that comes in the form of a phrase uh, with uh, natural language words. So this makes it very easy to, to save uh, your bitcoins. Um, because um, at the time where I did that, the alternative was, is, was either you use a hosted web wallet with all the dangers that come, come with it, or you are able to back up your private keys. And uh, the core client was generating these private keys a, a bit randomly, so you did not exactly know when you had to back up. It was really terrible. Um, so the feature of this uh, seed is that um, or maybe it's, I should call it the, the social contract of Electrum, what people expect is that from this seed phrase, they can recover all their money. And this is the, uh, the promise that I must not break. So uh, every version of Electrum has to be backward compatible. This is uh, why I did not accept to uh, use BIP39. It's a new version, it's a standard for, for seed phrases. And in my opinion, it would break this promise. So I don't want to, to go into that, this direction. Um, yeah. So this was uh, the big uh, defining characteristic of Electrum when it came out. And the other characteristic is that it was a client-server architecture. So this is a list of uh, servers from a website. So Electrum uses its uh, set of servers. Today, we have about 50, sometimes uh, a bit more servers running. So it's not a lot, but still, I mean, it's about almost 1% of the Bitcoin network. So it's also not so small. Um, so this client-server architecture is used in order to make things fast. 
and to allow you to uh, know your balance in instantly or quasi instantly. And if you need to restore from your seed, you will also need a server that knows the balance of every, every Bitcoin address. So this is uh, why a server is useful as opposed to a, a client that has to scan the whole blockchain. Okay. Um, so this is a brief history of, uh, of Electrum. Um, the initial release it was in November 2011. Uh, the following year, I uh, implemented SPV, Simple Payment Verification. And then the Qt GUI was introduced. The first GUI was uh, using GTK. Um, I also had to change the server code at some point because the initial uh, version was relying on a server that was using ABE. ABE was an engine for blockchain explorers, and it was very slow. So today, uh, the server uses a custom code uh, with a data structure for storing the, uh, the UTXOs separately from the spent outputs. So we have a database for UTXOs that is separate, and uh, it use, it's using a level DB. Uh, yeah. And then last year, we introduced Electrum 2.0 that was using BIP32 and uh, multi-sig capabilities. Uh, also, two-factor authentication. It's a special, uh, it's a special form of multi-sig where um, the co-signing is done by a company based in the US, trustedcoin.com. So all you need is Google Authenticator. And um, this is, uh, for the moment, it's uh, the main source of income of uh, my company. This is a paying service. Um, you can also use a hardware wallet if you want to secure your Bitcoins. And uh, this year we released for the first time the Android version. Okay, so in the resume you said that the market share of Electrum is between 5 and 10%. So 10% is grossly exager exaggerated. Uh, I came to this figure some time ago when I was uh, observing how many transactions were running on my own server and then uh, multiplying this by the number of servers, okay, we get something like 10%, even more. Uh, but it's not realistic because the number of uh, people who connect to a given server depends on the speed of this server. So uh, a better estimate uh, came about this year, and you can divide this number by two. Um, how do I come to that? Uh, I use the trusted coin data because uh, we can... Um, we can cross the data between how many transactions are propagated by my server, and from those transactions, I can see the proportion of transactions that are two-factor authenticated with a trusted coin. So then I can extrapolate in a much more sensible way because I don't assume that uh, every server has, is seeing the same traffic. I just assume that trusted coin transactions are spread equally over all the servers. And by the way, I can also have confidence intervals with that. They are not great. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, Electrum is designed in a, uh, with the idea that uh, if you want to increase security, security has to be easy to use. If you make something that is very complicated to use, then users are going to bypass security. So this is really something uh, important for me. Uh, you can make something very secure, but in the end, if it's a uh, cold storage uh, like Armory does it, it's very complicated and only a few people can use it. Um, I do not try to develop for others in the sense that I'm not trying to uh, put myself in the mind of a grandmother or someone who is computer illiterate because I don't think that this is a productive approach. Um, Often, people don't know what they want because they, they I mean, users who are not uh, into technical things, they don't really realize all the different possible ways to perform something. So my, uh, my view has always been, okay, I'm trying to, to develop a tool that is useful for myself, that, I, that myself I find efficient and, uh, and easy to use, and then uh, if others like it, well, it's better. But uh, I'm not absolutely following all the advices uh, from other people. Uh, also, when, uh, Electrum has a lot of features, but most of them are hidden. 
Uh, I believe that if a feature is dangerous, then you should hide it from most users. And the best way to hide it is to put it in the, in the command line interface. So Electrum has a rich command line, and uh, you can do a lot of things with it that you cannot do uh, with the GUI. And often I, I, I refuse to introduce too many things in the GUI, even if they are, even, even if they have been there for a long time in the command line interface, because I think, okay, for some kind of features, like for example, if you want to use your own entropy for the seeds, okay, you can do that with Electrum, but please <laughs> use the GUI. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is going to go against what I just said against ease of, ease of use versus security, because of course there is a trade-off. There is a, a, a lot of uh, different uh, types of uh, Bitcoin wallets, and this is a kind of a classification with uh, security on the y-axis and ease of use. So ease of use can also be ease of deployment because it's much more difficult to write a wallet that is decentralized, that is truly decentralized, instead of uh, something that relies on a centralized server. Um, so you have full nodes that give you full security. You have uh, SPV with full blocks, or at least that's what you used to have because today it doesn't exist anymore. Um, today, SPV clients are in this blue dot. Yeah, so you have Bloom filter clients and Electrum. So this is the, the two ways to perform SPV today. Uh, full block SPV means that you have a client that downloads the full blocks and then trashes them. It, ke it keeps only what it needs. Uh, but uh, it was uh, too resource demanding, so most SPV clients uh, switched to the Bloom filter model, and Electrum did not switch because it had its own model before. Uh, then you have server trusting clients. So this category includes Mycelium, Copay. Uh, most of the lightweight clients are like that. If you go to bitcoin.org and you look at, at this page, uh, choose your wallet, you'll see um, centralized validation, I believe. This is how they call it. So uh, it means that uh, actually the, the client is not validating anything. It's the server that is validating, and your client is trusting the server. And then you have web wallets. So here this, the security is very low. Uh, even if it's a web wallet like blockchain.info that does not have your private keys, uh, if a hacker can... Uh, uh, compromise the server of blockchain.info, they can, I mean, they can control the, the code that you are running. So they can steal your bitcoins. And if you give me access to their server, I will not steal the bitcoins of everybody. I will target people. I'm going to target the big wallets and I'm going to send them uh, code that steals their private key. And then I'm not going to steal the coins immediately. I'm going to replace the code with the original one before so that I can steal the coins after that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, yeah uh, but the way I describe it is, uh, is also terrible because uh, there is no proof of anything. I mean, the, the bitcoins just disappear from your wallet and uh, the, the server operators are going to tell you, no, you're crazy, you spent them. <laughs> okay, so yeah, and I did not write this in this spectrum, but you also you also have the the so-called Bitcoin banks, where uh, so custodian wallets that hold bitcoins for you. So this would be Coinbase or what is the well, I guess Coinbase is the is the main one. Um, this type of wallet is uh, they can also steal your coins, of course, but at the same time. Maybe you are protected because these are companies that have a responsibility. And if they, if they steal your money, you could actually prove it. Uh, more than in, with a web wallet uh, like blockchain.info. So I don't know even uh, which one is uh, better or worse. Uh, I, don't, yeah, I don't like them, but I, I cannot tell that uh, anyone is superior to the other. Yeah. I have a lot of slides on that. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, before talking about SPV, I mean, you have different types of threads on, on, on your wallet. 
and the main threat is not uh, that your bitcoins are going to be, to be stolen, is that you're going to lose them. So this is really the main source of, uh, of losses. Um, and this is, uh, so the solution to that, in my opinion, is, is uh, to use deterministic wallets, because then uh, it's much easier to, to back up your keys. So this was the main motivation for me to, to write Electrum. It was this, uh, I mean, people really tend to focus on super fancy scenarios of compromission, but the main source of loss is just users who screw their backup. Okay? And still today with Electrum, I have users that uh, don't understand uh, why they cannot retrieve their bitcoins if they lose both their password and the seed. And uh, recently I had someone who was asking me, okay, so you get to, to keep my bitcoins if I lose both? <laughs> because they believe that we are a bank. But no, okay. So it's, uh, I think it's the best uh, way to do, but it doesn't solve everything. So I recommend also to use paper and not to store your seed electronically um, for various reasons. You, you can lose anything that is electronic and it can also be compromised. Yeah. So the second source is, uh, the second threat is of course theft. And the main scenario of theft is actually an intrusion in your computer, a physical intrusion. That means you give access to, to your computer to someone. Uh, Yes? No? <laughs> okay. So, like, I have the scenario of a user that was um, uh, buying or selling coins, I don't remember, but uh, he handed over the laptop to someone in the back seat of his car while he was driving, and uh, then his uh, bitcoins disappeared. Someone he met on localbitcoin.com. Yeah. And he didn't know. So the easiest way to do that is actually to replace the wallet of the victim with another wallet. And if they don't have many transactions, they are not, or if they don't put lab labels on their transactions, they, they just don't notice. Um, yeah, well, hosted wallet, use a real wallet. And um, so malicious code is really the, the scenario that everybody is talking about. It does not happen so often. And today, the main uh, ways to protect yourself about that is to use multi-signature or hardware wallets. These are really good protections. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that's it for the main, the losses and the theft. So the third uh, scenario is when the, networks, the network lies to you. This is uh, what SPV is about. Um, it does not happen so often. It's really, uh, it's more theoretical, but uh, we want to address that too. Um, so uh, you have different types of lies, if you set apart statistics. So you have plain lies, when that means uh, I'm telling you an information that is uh, not true. I'm telling you that you receive my bitcoins, but actually you didn't receive anything. So the network is making up a transaction that does not exist. And then the other category is lying by omission, not showing you a transaction that you should see. So uh, there is much less harm that you can do in this case. Um, but uh, it would also be good to, to address that. So the first, uh, the answer to plain lies is SPV. SPV is a proof of uh, correctness. It proves that the transactions that you see in your wallet do actually exist in the blockchain. And uh, in order to address lies by omission, we need a proof of uh, completeness, which we don't have yet, but uh, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah and we also use uh, SSL authentication in order to uh, protect users against uh, man in the middle attack. So this scenario is uh, if somebody controls the access that you have to the internet, and then they show you a fake version of the Bitcoin uh, network with nodes that, uh, that give you uh, headers, but uh, the information, since you are an SPV client, you cannot verify that the Bitcoins actually exist in this scenario. So if you are not connected to the real Bitcoin network, then uh, you might be a target of money in the middle attack. Okay, uh, so this is just, uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to skip that. Uh, this is just about uh, what I mean, it's pretty much redundant with what I just said. Uh, just, um, 
Yeah, so if you are full node, you don't need man in the middle protection. So I did not uh, write a plus there. It's not, it doesn't mean that uh, you should have it. But uh, as long as you, as you fall into the category of Bloom filter, it would be useful to have that. Uh, and of course, yes, there is also the issue of uh, censorship resistance. I did not talk about that. But uh, wallets that are trusting a server, web wallets, custodian wallets, they are all uh, susceptible to uh, censorship. I mean, you, you just take down the server. Okay, so I'm going to explain briefly SPV for people who are not familiar with. I guess uh, some of you don't need this explanation. Um, so a hash function is a function that is not invertible. That means uh, if I give you an object x, uh, I can compute its hash very easily. But if I give you the hash, it's impossible to know uh, what was x that was uh, generating this hash. And it's also uh, impossible or very, very difficult to find collisions, to find two x and y that produce the same hash. If a hash function has collisions, then it's considered to be broken. It can be used as a proof of integrity if you download the file from the internet. It can be used as a proof of existence. If you put the hash of a document into the blockchain, then it's a proof that this document existed at the time where you put the hash. And it can also be used as a proof of inclusion if in, a, in a larger set. This is what SPV is about. So in a Bitcoin block, uh, you have a set of transactions and um, each transaction has a hash, and the block builds a tree structure of hashes. So it creates, uh, in this example, four transactions. It uses four hashes, and then uh, it computes hash, hashes of the pairs of children and up until the root. So the root hash is, a, is going to be included in the block, and uh, it's a proof that a transaction in, in this is in, in, in the block. If I give you a transaction and I give you a way to, uh, to go back from this transaction to the root hash, for example, if you have the, the, the other hashes that are used to, to produce the root hash, then you can uh, be certain that this transaction was used in order to build the block. So SPV uh, is doing exactly that. A client that is doing SPV is downloading what is called the Merkle branch of uh, transaction. So um, that means that uh, in this, on the left here, uh, you have this transaction where Alice gives bitcoins to Bob. And uh, the green uh, boxes are the hash, well, the first green box is the hash of your transaction. Uh, then the blue boxes contain the hashes that you request in order to have your proof and you combine them pairwise until the root, and that allows you to verify that you, at the end, that you get the same root hash as is supposed to be in the block, okay? So in order to have this proof that the transaction is in a block, you need um, this Merkle branch, and you need also to, to verify the headers of the Bitcoin blockchain. So SPV clients are doing that. They download, instead of downloading the, the whole uh, Bitcoin blocks, they just uh, download the headers. And this information is much smaller. It's, uh, it's growing at a pace of uh, 4 megabytes per year. And this uh, number is uh, invariant. No, mat no matter how big the blocks are going to be, it's always going to be 4 megabytes per year. Because the only thing that is going to grow is the, the size of the proof. The size of the proof is the, the, the length of this uh, branch of uh, blue boxes. And this proof is growing in a logarithm, in log n, when, where n is the size of the block. So it's growing much slower than the Bitcoin blocks. So this, this kind of proof is compact, is short. And uh, so SPV clients check that every transaction they receive from the network are going to, are included in the block. They do it by requesting the Merkle branch, and they also do it by requesting all the headers from the Bitcoin blockchain. So if there is a fork in the Bitcoin blockchain, they can also decide which branch has the biggest difficulty, and they know that this is the, the, the best, uh, the winning branch. Yes? Do the SPV clients need to see all the 
Well, they can trust a uh, header somewhere in the middle, but uh, it's not it's not a lot actually to have all the headers. No, if there is a real organization, they 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 follow it. They 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 must be able to to uh, to decide between two branches. But then they can trash the the losing branch. Okay. So I'm going to complain about uh, people who claim that Electrum is not doing SPV because this is something I hear a lot. I read it in the forum. So uh, SPV, the, I, I've, I've seen that not, uh, I mean, every couple of months I, I read something that is uh, looking like this. So SPV wallets connect to the Bitcoin network. Oh, Electrum does connect to its own set of servers. Therefore, Electrum cannot be a SPV wallet. Last time it was this uh, open, what was it called? Open Bitcoin privacy project that was making such a statement. And uh, yeah, well, so I call this the old thinking because it's like uh, when you have this banking system where who you are talking to is really important. Uh, I think Bitcoin has introduced a, a change of parting that has not been understood by everybody. It doesn't matter who you are talking to with Bitcoin, it's not the medium that is the message, it's the message itself, okay? So SPV is about verifying difficulty, and Bitcoin is about not trusting who you are talking to, but you do not trust the identity of the person that you are talking to, you trust the content of the message. In that case, you verify the difficulty of the chain. Yeah, okay, so that was my uh, little rant. <laughs> um, so why do we use SSL then if the, if the message only matters? Well, because SPV clients are still, uh, tar can still be a target of a man in the middle attack. Uh, it's not very likely that all the Electrum servers are going to conspire against you because Electrum is decentralized. Uh, you have uh, anonymous random people that are allowed to, to run a node and there is no control over that. I, I have no control over that. So um, you must not uh, be uh, scared about uh, all the, the Electrum nodes conspiring against you, okay? However, what is possible is that whoever controls your internet connection can actually uh, mislead you. So uh, it means they could uh, fake the Bitcoin network and they could present you blocks that are actually not in the Bitcoin blockchain but they mined uh, separately and they can make you believe that this is the longest chain. In practice, it means that they can make you believe that you have been paid Bitcoins in order for you to give euros. And then, of course, once you connect to the real Bitcoin blockchain, you realize that this payment did not exist. So this is why uh, money in the middle attack is still possible with SPV wallets. And um, uh, with Electrum, we address this with the SSL. So we do not, um, we do not use uh, uh, CAs, we allow uh, certificate pinning, which means that the first time that you connect to the network and that you see a server, you're going to accept the certificate, even if it's uh, self-signed. Uh, maybe in the future there will be an option in order to allow only uh, CA signed certificates, but today uh, the proportion of servers that have a CA signed certificate is, uh, is too small. So we, we, uh, we use certificate pinning. So the only danger that I, about what I said before, about um, uh, money in the middle attack, would be if you connect for the first time, the very first time, your client to the internet, and then uh, your connection is owned by someone who is uh, trying to screw you. So that would be the, the only scenario where you can be the victim of this kind of attack. Okay. Yeah, and another benefit, of course, is privacy. Uh, communications between the Electrum client and the server are encrypted. This is important uh, in comparison to the Bloom filter model of SPV because uh, with Electrum, uh, you give away your Bitcoin addresses to one server. Um, 
you have actually control over that. You can you can decide. Well, you can switch. You can use auto connect, and then uh, it will connect randomly. But if you are really concerned about privacy, you can also decide to give away your Bitcoin address to a single server that you choose. Um, in my opinion, this is much better than the other way to do SPV today, which is uh, the Bloom filter. Because with the Bloom filter, you have uh, uh, you publish your Bloom filter. You show it to the Bitcoin network. I mean, you show it to all the nodes from from where you request uh, your, your your transactions. And with the Bloom filter, uh, it's not. I mean, the, of course, the Bloom filter has a setting. You can you can make it very specific or very broad. If it's broad, then it's more private. But wallets don't do that because the broadest it is and the larger the blocks you download. If you want to be a lightweight client, you have to have a, a very specific filters. And then you can, uh, with a, so, uh, so with a Bloom filter, you, you publish actually your Bloom filter to the entire world and you have no control over, over who is going to, to see it. So, so that's why I, I believe Electrum has a better privacy model, even if it's not perfect, of course. Um, if you want perfect privacy, you have to, to, to run a full node. There is a, yeah, I'm not making the claim that I am more private than a full node. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, the last part that is missing is the proof of completeness. SPV proves you that uh, your transactions are real, that they are in the Bitcoin blockchain. But you have no proof that you you received all of them unless you are well i don't have that slide anymore but it was a yeah if you are a full node spv which doesn't exist anymore today then you you also know that you have all your transactions but with the bloom filter as well as with electrum you you don't have that proof so uh, the network can hide some transactions from you uh -huh. So today, um, the Electrum server is building a data structure called a, a Patricia tree of all the UTXOs. All UTXO means uh, unspent transaction outputs, which is uh, your coins, basically. Okay. Um, and it would be possible to have a proof of completeness, to have a proof that your client knows everything about its transactions, if you do trust the root hash of this data structure, okay? So um, Ethereum does store the root hash in the block. Uh, Ethereum does not use UTXOs. It's a, it's a slightly different system, but in the end, it's not very different. Uh, in Bitcoin, we would need to do that with UTXOs. And of course, if we want to store that in the, in the in the uh, in the blocks, we need a soft fork. I don't think it's likely to happen, uh, so uh, we have to find uh, other solutions. Um, so, how are we going to do that? Well, there are some research papers about that. Uh, one year ago, there was a paper by MIT called uh, Versum. So, um, the idea is that. Uh, well, okay, Versum is a bit complicated. I mean, what I'm describing here is much simpler. Um, the Electrum server, they can also sign the root hash, okay, because they are authenticated by SSL. They, uh, so they can have a, a, a key that will sign the root hash that they find for every block. And the client is able to report inconsistent hashes between two servers. A client can also, can also be smart and they can request the root hash over the blockchain and by dichotomy in log n iterations, they can identify where two servers diverge in their answer. So they can also know precisely which, uh, which uh, block transition is, uh, is not consistent between two servers. And then they can also request these two blocks and verify and know which server was the liar. If you are a server and that uh, you are honest, you can also know that the other one is a liar without doing all this, okay? Um, so servers, they can store proof of lies, either reported by clients or, the, or verified by themselves, and they can also blacklist all the peers that uh, would lie about the, the root hash. 
So uh, this is how, uh, so this is not implemented in Electrum yet, but this is uh, how I'm going to do it when I find time. <laughs> but there are more urgent things to do for the moment. Okay, so I'm just uh, going to review quickly uh, some features of Electrum. So we support the, the payment protocol, BIP70. Um, we do not support all the features of, the, of BIP70. In my opinion, the most important feature is uh, that the request is signed because it gives consumer protection. If you have a merchant that wants a payment and they send you just a Bitcoin address, it's a little bit uncomfortable because, okay, I'm going to send Bitcoins to this address and then what? You have no proof that you paid the merchant. With BIP70, uh, the payment request is signed. So in the Electron client, this is uh, materialized with this green color. Instead of showing a Bitcoin address, it shows the domain that signs the request. And uh, the green color means that the signature was checked and is correct. And we also have, uh, so, so Electron works also with command line and with a diamond. So as a merchant, you can use the, the Electron diamond in order to uh, request payments. Of course, um, we do not uh, convert your payment into euros because uh, this is, uh, we are not a payment processor. This is software that you run on your machine and you have full control of. So if you run this software, you can request payments like BitPay or Coinbase, but uh, your invoices will not, uh, will not be converted to euros. The advantage is that instead of, of uh, seeing uh, uh, BitPay.com, they will see your domain in the in the payment request, which is a bit more classy. <laughs> okay, um, so Electrum is also a company, and uh, uh, the way uh, it works currently is uh, I provide uh, services from uh, third parties through plugins. So. Um, uh, the, the Electrum has a plugin system, and the, those plugins are a way to uh, to provide services that can be free or paying. Um, at this point, we have this two-factor authentication from Trusted Coin, which is a paying service. Um, if you are a hardware wallet designer, it's going to be free for you, unless you want me to write the plugin. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, we are also investigating the possibility to link your wallet to your bank account and to buy, sell uh, bitcoins uh, from the wallet. Uh, proof of reserves is something that I have, uh, well, I have proposed to some exchanges. Currently, the way they do it is that they pick someone who is an auditor. But it would actually be possible to have pr uh, proof of reserve continuously. So every time you connect to your, to your Bitcoin exchange, it can also check that uh, the balance that they show to you is in the possession. This would be technically possible instead of uh, doing an audit every six months. But okay, for the moment it's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, well, okay, Electrum has a rich command line. This is what I was saying at the beginning. Um, so you can re request the balance of any address, not just the address from your account. And uh, you can use pipes. So this uh, example shows you how to list the addresses of your wallet that have some bitcoins. So with the funded option. Uh, the vertical bar is a pipe. If you're not a programmer, you don't know what it is, but okay. Um, so you can get the private keys from all those addresses and then you can sweep them into another address. And this command is going to, not to sweep the coins directly, but to produce a transaction that you have to broadcast. Okay. Uh, so when I was uh, preparing this talk, actually, uh, I was planning to have released uh, the next version, but uh, I didn't have time to do it. So I'm going to talk about the features that are going to be included in uh, Electron 2.7. Um, yeah. So I, I hope it will be released. Uh, maybe th there will be uh, some binaries available next week, but uh, that that should be a pre a pre-release, not the final one. Uh, it still needs some testing. So the main. Uh, 
change is that uh, there is a separation between wallet and key store. So uh, it was not the case until now. Uh, key store is uh, the method that you use to store your private keys. So it can be software or it can be a hardware wallet. Uh, these are types of key stores. And then the wallet type is, disassoci is dissociated from that. So wallet types is uh, about the type of contract that you use. Wallet type is a multi-sig or single signature or importing Bitcoin addresses or importing private keys. These are, no, well, sorry, importing private keys is not a wallet type, it's a key store. Yeah, but importing Bitcoin addresses is a wallet type because you don't know what kind of contract you have behind these, those addresses. And this allows us then to uh, do all the possible combinations between key stores and wallets. In, in practice, it allows us to use multiple hardware wallets within the same multi-sig wallet. So this is what is shown on the screen, screenshot here. If you are familiar with Electrum, you might know that uh, if you use a Trezor, you have a tr small Trezor icon. So this is a two of three multi-sig wallet that I built with three different hardware wallets. And uh, uh, the green or the red dot shows whether the hardware wallet is plugged. So in that case, you have Trezor and uh, Ledger that are plugged, which is two, two co-signers, so it's sufficient in order to sign uh, the transaction fully. Otherwise, it's only signed partially. Yeah. Okay, and, uh, and the other main feature that we are going to introduce is uh, uh, replace by fee. So um, there is also a slider in the, or I don't have a screenshot for that, but there will be a slider when you can, uh, you can use dynamic fees and select the expected confirmation time. So one block, two block, five, 10, or 25. It doesn't make, a, yeah. uh, it doesn't make a dis, uh, di, uh, really, it doesn't make sense to, to, uh, to make a distinction between 25 blocks and 24 because uh, the data is, uh, is uh, but between 25 and 10, it, it makes sense. Um, yeah, and that's it. Um, do I have another slide? Yeah, well, okay, sure. <laughs> Future work. Uh, segregated witness. So, um, I think, yeah, well, before this lunch uh, with Peter, I thought that I have to rewrite the, the Electrum server, but maybe not, uh, if, uh, if we use the, the P2SH addresses that, uh, that exist here today. So, yeah, but in the long run, it will we will still uh, have to rewrite the, the, the server, um, and that's uh, not ready yet. Uh, payment channels are needed urgently because currently uh, with trusted coin we generate a lot of transactions uh, for which uh, these transactions have well, okay let me explain the user can uh, pay per transaction and then each transaction has a extra output that pays trusted coin or they can uh, prepay they can buy prepaid transactions but uh, then they get a discount but they don't really do that most of the time so uh, I think we're going to save some blockchain space if we switch to a, to a payment channel solution. And of course, the payment channel is the first step towards the Lightning Network. I'm a big supporter of, uh, of SegWit and of the Lightning Network. I, I really like this, uh, these ideas. Um, but the consequence for Electrum is that uh, with the Lightning Network, uh, it's going to be difficult to recover all your money from the seed phrase. Uh, my users, Electrum users, have been uh, uh, used to this ID and it's very deeply engraved in their mind now that they only need to store the seed phrase. So uh, we need to provide a service that is actually going to do this job for them uh, because in a payment channel, uh, the, the transaction is not on the blockchain until it's uh, closed. So the, the temporary transactions that are in the channel are actually holding money for you and you don't want to lose them. And users are good at losing the, the data. So um, there has to be a service that will, uh, that will do this for them. Yeah, uh, okay. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I would like also to thank all the Electrum developers. 
I'm the main one, but there is a, we have been receiving contributions for more than 100 people now. Okay, most of them are small, but uh, some of them not so small. Uh, server operators are important for the, uh, for the Electrum ecosystem. Uh, most of these uh, server operators run on donations or they do it just to improve the, the overall ecosystem. Maybe one, once we have payment channels, there will be a solution also f in order to, to, for them to, to earn a little bit of money. But currently the donations are not a very good model. <laughs> um, Greg Maxwell has been extremely useful, especially in the first versions of, of Electron. Andy Weidenbaum is a private sponsor who uh, paid for the development of the Android version, the new Android version. I used to, there used to be an older Android version that was not on Google Play because it was too ugly. Yeah, and uh, Eagle is a contributor who is administrator of the Electron Foundry. Okay, thank you for your attention. Maybe we can do a short uh, Q&A, is that okay? Does anyone have a question? Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. It's always interesting to meet actually the people who develops the software I'm using, so <laughs> very interesting. Um, two questions, how, how large do you think is your market share? Uh, well, I said, I mean, 5% is uh, uh, maybe, maybe you missed that slide, you were not here? Yes, I was here. When I showed this slide. Mm -hmm. um, this was market share. Hmm? This was market share. I mean, uh, uh, all clients in use, you think about 5%. Yes, yeah. it's not about the number of clients, it's about the number of transactions. Uh, we can also measure the number of downloads, but it's not reliable at all, especially since Electrum is also shipping with uh, some Linux distributions we don't know about. Um, so the way we measure that is by uh, estimating the number of transactions that are transiting through the Electrum servers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also not a very good measure because uh, Electrum servers have been used by blockchain.info as a backup. <laughs> so maybe some transactions that we see on our servers do not originate from the Electrum client. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the way we so the the way we measure that is by uh, so initially I was uh, I was uh, extrapolating the data from my server, and now that we have trusted coin, we have a slightly more reliable way of uh, of measuring that. Mm -hmm. So we get about five percent. Mm -hmm. uh, second question: Do you intend to support also future alternative implementation of, of the Bitcoin protocol? What does that mean? Let's say some some different application. You mean like a Bitcoin Classic, for, for example? example? Yeah. Uh, so Electrum itself is agnostic. I I do not have any control over what the Electrum uh, administrators of the the, the Electrum uh, servers do. They can run Bitcoin Classic or, or Bitcoin uh, not Classic on on their node. Uh, there is nothing I can do about that, really. Uh, so, in that sense, it is decentralized. Personally, I, I do support Bitcoin Core, uh, if that was the question. Now, about other things, other implementations, I don't know. Uh, you need to be more specific. No, that's okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, speaking of download numbers, I probably bumped up Electrum downloads by just two over my whole Bitcoin you know, ownership. And the reason is uh, that I am very hesitant to deploy new versions because I don't generally trust. I mean, the question is about how do you build your software, basically. And for me, as a user, the fewer versions I download, the less likely I'm going to stamp on malicious code. Can you speak on how is your process around that? Do you use GitHub? Do you sign um, contribution? Do, do, do you sign individual commits of, com of, of, of contributors? I do not sign each commit. I do sign the, the binaries and uh, also the, the tarball uh, with the same key that I, I showed the, the fingerprint at the beginning of the, the presentation. And that key, obviously, is not on the server. 
do you do like distributed builds? Get, does a second maintainer get to do the build for you and then you verify them? Is there no, any? No, uh, we do not have deterministic builds. Um, we have been trying to have that, but the tools that, uh, it's written in Python, and the, the tools that exist in Python do not allow us to, to produce deterministic builds at this point. Uh, but uh, some people worked on it, I worked on it. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not lost, it's just not the main priority. Mm. Uh, if I you want attach. to work on it, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, w one thing that maybe attaches to that question is, you said you're going to have or you have an Android version. Yeah. Um, and at the beginning, you, you told us about the possibility of um, blockchain or the info that could wrap out code and steal private keys. Mm -hmm. How is that model different? Um, I mean, somebody could steal your Google account, publish an, up, an upload of an application, users have enabled auto, up, yeah. auto updates. Uh, the, the model is a bit different in the sense that if you use JavaScript, you are downloading the code every time you open your wallet. With this kind of wallet, updates are much less frequent. So if an update is compromised, um, well, if my server was compromised and somebody put uh, binaries that I did not sign, Okay, a few users would probably uh, get caught, but at some point people will notice because the signature will not match. And this is the same security model as uh, all the, the software wallets. On Android, um, it's a little bit different because... Uh, no, it's not, it's not different because uh, my key is also needed to sign the APK. Uh, I guess, unless it's from Google, uh, it's safe. I mean, Google could could do it, but uh, someone could not. Just the yeah. numbers. I mean, five percent of all transactions could mean five percent of all bitcoins. Just the inside shopping. Actually, Google actually, Bounties it could be it could, could mean be one more million. than that because uh, Electrum is used as cold storage. It's used by people who hold a large number of bitcoins. I started when I started Electrum. I did not put. I did not use it for all my Bitcoins. I had uh, most of my savings in Bitcoin Core. And then there was this bug in Bitcoin Qt where they realized that the encryption wasn't really encrypting the private keys everywhere. There was a, a, a chunk of memory where the private keys was clear. And my wallet, my Bitcoin Core wallet, was in the cloud on Amazon at, at that time. <laughs> so from that day, I stopped using it and I used Electrum for all my Bitcoin. At least, uh, I think it's also, I mean, I know what is in it, and uh, um, it's also much less complex. I mean, Bitcoin Core is very complex, so it's, uh, it's very difficult to have both the protocol and the wallet in the same program. With, uh, with Electrum, you have a little bit more of isolation. Yes. I mean, Electrum seems to be one of the best, if not the dominant, uh, desktop wallet. Um, but there are other Android wallets that, that I would say are more more popular, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of um, we are we we launched on Android uh, this year, so uh, we don't have so many yeah. users for the Android wallet. And uh, going, going forward, do you have a, a vision for where your focus will be, or where you'll be? I mean, is it going to be like a cold storage wallet, or trying to be both? Uh, you can use uh, both uh, the Android and the desktop version as cold storage. Uh, I have here a phone that is not connected to the internet and I can use it with Electrum on it as cold storage. Uh, you can send the transactions that you want to sign over by QR code. And uh, of course the transaction must not be too big, but it works uh, for, for anything reasonable. So you, you, you send the transaction via QR code to your phone and it signs it. And once it is signed, it shows it as another QR code that you can scan from your other device. So you, you, there is no distinction between the, the, the desktop and the, and the Android version. They are both capable of that. Okay, so you, you intend to target both of those use cases, you know? Yeah, the, uh, the, the upcoming release will have also multi-sig wallets in the Android version. 
uh, which was not supported until now. Um, and uh, in the future, we also uh, plan to support hardware wallets with the Android phone. Uh, for the moment, you can only use this, uh, these hardware wallets with your desktop application. It's not supported in the Android version. But really, I mean, the, 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 what I want to do now is a segregated witness and the payment channels. It's, <laughs> it's the priority. It is always uh, recommended that you do not store the password um, digitally. And you also mentioned that. But if uh, someone is traveling and does not want to do that. You mean the seed phrase? The seed phrase, yeah. uh, store it on, or write it on a paper. What would be um, another way of storing it safely? Uh, that's a good question. I think paper is safer because uh, at least uh, there is no... Um, how to say that? Paper is uh, is human friendly. Uh, it can we burn. It can burn, yeah, but uh, uh, it cannot be. It can be protected. Uh, I mean, if you. Well, it depends what you trust more. If you if you are really trusting yourself about your capability of securing your computer, then why not? But uh, most users. Uh, get uh, victims of uh, virus of uh, intrusions so uh, yeah you're never sure that the computer is not compromised until uh, you know that it is <laughs> yeah I have, I have actually the answer for that uh, Max Fronti made some CDs with the Electron logo okay. and Bitcoin logo so you can just store your seed on CDs and you can get some from there if you want Thing. Thanks a lot, Max. <laughs> really cool. Old school. I don't have a CD <laughs> um, driver, but uh, thanks. Any more questions? Very good. Electron yeah. server. If I would host an electron server, I have some machines. Yeah. I could offer some server. What would I risk? Is there a new class uh, of attacks or something I should take care of? You risk to use some of your disk space. Yes, I don't care. It's cheap. Memory. CPU cheap. memory, yeah. Well, uh, no, uh, I mean, if your server is compromised, uh, nothing really bad can happen. Uh, I mean, the only thing that can happen is that uh, the client that connect to your server will not see all the transactions. It's what I talked about, proof of completeness. But uh, usually people would notice if you, uh, if uh, SPV is a protection against uh, you, your server telling lies to the users, so you cannot lie unless you lie by omission. And lying by omission is uh, usually detected by the users themselves. Uh, would be blacklisted, that's all. Yeah, that's not uh, already the case. We don't have, we have not implemented that. But, yeah. but there is not much risk uh, except uh, yeah, you're going to use some memory and some disk, yeah. but uh, that's all. Thanks. Sure. Uh, yes? Yeah, it trusts the server on that. Uh, there is a um, there is a threshold that must not that it must not exceed, so that uh, the server cannot attack the user by uh, arbitrarily large fees. But uh, the, you, you have the choice as a user. You can use dynamic fees, and if you use dynamic fees, then it will trust the server about the, this, uh, this information. If you don't want to do that, you disable it. You can use a, a fixed fee per kilobyte that you decide on yourself. And also, uh, if the fee is very large for your transaction, there is a pop-up that will tell you that the fee looks uh, wrong. Yes. It, it, sorry. It sounds like you've got direct contact with the end users, the actual um, the actual users. What trends have you seen uh, in the user community from the beginning until now? Are they 
still broad in field? Well, I, I think that every time there is a wave of uh, Bitcoin adoption, new user f uh, flow en masse to the web wallet. And then, <laughs> then uh, when we are in a period like now, they, they switch to uh, software wallet. Yeah. It depends. Uh, there is all kind of users. Uh, Electrum has really a wide spectrum of users. Okay. Thanks a lot. It was very interesting. So, <laughs> thanks for coming.